you're live. Oh, hey y'all, I'm James Wright, and welcome to the shop. Today we're going to be doing a live Q&A. We do this once a month, uh, usually on the middle Tuesday of the month. We go live every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Central Time. So if you want to join us, hop in there, and uh, we'll have fun every week. Um, so if you have any questions, go ahead and throw those in the chat. Though we do have quite a few right off the bat because we had... Uh, Harold hopped on and he had a pile of questions, so we'll be getting to as many as we can. Um, and as always, if you do throw up a super chat, we will get to your question next. So we'll be having a little bit of a fun tonight and kind of a laid back, uh, like back time. Uh, if you are watching this recorded and you're not live, then you'll actually see down in the time bar it is broken up into chunks uh, so that you can see what all the questions are and jump straight to the question that you want to be in. Um, you can also read all the questions down in the description below if it isn't uh, live. So if you're watching this recorded, yay. <laughs> um, so enough of that. Let's, uh, let's jump into it. We got questions to hit. What, what's, what's the first one on the list? Um, well, first question is from Lego Man. Yeah, Lego Man. Uh, what do you think about the low angle jointer from Veritas? I have one that, and it works great, but I can't help but think the low angle style has no benefits on a jointer. Yeah, um, Veritas has a whole low angle style um, series, so you can get the low angle smoother, the low angle jack, and the low angle jointer. Um, and there are a lot of people out there who really, really like it. The nice thing about the low angle is it's easier to push. It's a simpler plane. There's less bells and whistles and adjustments, so there's there's less problems with it. Um, and for the jointer, honestly, it's not going to make that big a difference. Um, it is a little easier to push. Um, so some people like that, like uh, Shan Rogers at the Hand Tool School. He particularly um, uses the low angle jointer quite a bit. Um, I'm not a huge fan of low angle planes, but again, it's a personal preference thing. So um, yeah, uh, for me, it's not worth the money, but uh, some people really like it. Some people don't. So hope that answers your question. <laughs> What's next? Um, oh, sorry, I got an eyelash. That's... Ooh, I hate that. Uh, anyways, Harold... Harold's first question is... <laughs> yeah, thank you, Harold. You, you put a whole bunch in there. I want to restore some old hand saws. Can you talk a little about how to deal with rust and pits in the saw plate? Yeah, I have uh, several videos on that. And once you start talking about saw restoration, you will see way more answers than there are saws to be restored. Um, there, there are a lot of different things out there, and different people will swear by different techniques. Uh, for me, I like WD-40 and sanding. Um, if, if it's fairly light, I might scrape it off. I'm not a huge fan of scraping, unless there's an etch to protect. If there's an etch, then scraping is generally the way I'm going to do it, or I'm going to be using a, uh, a stiff block on a sanding, um, a sanding block. Um, the actual rust inside, uh, inside of the pit, to get that out, you've you, um, you got to use a, like a, a scouring pad. I like to use a um, triple lot steel or a, a light scotch bright pad. Uh, that'll get in there and clean it out quickly. But I usually use WD-40 and then wipe it off. Um, if I have a big tub of Evaporust, I'd use that. Uh, I used to use vinegar quite a bit, and as long as you're careful with it, vinegar works perfectly fine. I know a lot of people really poo-poo it. Um, there's a bunch of reasons for and against it, but it's dirt cheap, and you can, you can get rid of the rust almost instantly with vinegar. Um, but it's, it's kind of one of those things that there's, there's really no wrong way to do it. There's just a hundred right ways to do it. Um, so usually the most common answer is sanding with lubricant like a WD-40 or a simple green or something of that nature. Um, and then uh, wiping it off and polishing it down, adding some oil to protect it, and you're good to go. The actual pitting, you don't have to get rid of the pitting. Um, because it's inside the surface, it's not going to cause any problem. And actually, I like a little bit of pitting on the saw. It actually allows the wax and oil to fit in there so I can lubricate the saw and it lasts a little bit longer. Um, I'm not... You know, if I have a good shiny saw, I like a good shiny saw, but the pitting is not a problem. Um, so don't worry about that too much, as long as you get the rust out so it's not continuing to eat into it further. So yeah, what's the next question? Okay, hang on. Looks like we got an active group on there tonight. Yeah, uh, let's see, Harold again. Um, saw plates, do you have a tip on how to make the etch more visible? Ha, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, <clears throat> some people will paint the saw and then sand off the paint. And because the etch is a little bit lower, the paint that's in the etch will be in there. I'm just not a huge fan of adding the paint to the saw. Um, and there, yeah, there really isn't a way of, of making the etch much more visible because 
it is eat, it's it's actually eaten into the plate so the etch is is has like a um, a recess into the plate itself and so if you clean off too much of the regular plate you'll take the whole plate down to the depth of the etch and then the etch disappears um, so over time the etch will naturally disappear um, so that's it's not something that is you know always going to be there it's something you've got to protect if you want to keep it um, but yeah once it's worn away it's worn away it's not something you can bring back so yeesh, not so fun what's next okay i feel like to ask you in a second i'm trying to <laughs> this. all right um here i'll begin handles on old hand saws are dry and cracked how would you restore them strip sand and add blo uh, yeah, well, if they're cracked, you have to look at the crack and, and, and think about how big the crack is. Um, when you add, because if it's, if it's a really dried out handle, what I'll often do is I'll take the handle off and I'll get a Ziploc bag and fill the Ziploc bag up with BLO and put the, uh, put the handle in there, close it, and I'll let it sit in there for a couple days and let it soak in as much as possible. Um, and uh, I, I've actually, uh, um, uh, I've tried doing it with a vacuum chamber before. And that works rather well, but if you don't have a vacuum chamber, just letting it soak for a while um, does the trick pretty well. And you just want to get the oil into it as much as possible. And then you're going to take it out and you're going to hang it up and let it drip off and drip dry uh, for a little while. And then wipe off all the excess and then some more will come out. You'll wipe off the excess and some more will come out. You just don't want it to dry completely with the excess on there or you'll get a buildup that's hard to take off. Um, and so that's how I kind of rejuvenate the... the uh, um, the, the, the wood. If the crack is too big, you're going to need to stabilize it because there's no way of compressing the crack back together. I mean, if, if the cracks are small and hairline, filling it back up with a fluid will compress those cracks. The wood will expand and, uh, uh, as it absorbs the material, and so it will push the cracks closed. But if the crack is too big, um, no amount of pushing is going to push it back together, and it's always a weak spot. And so often what I'm going to do is I'm going to epoxy fill that crack um, just to kind of stabilize it, um, either with an injector or I'll use a thin epoxy or a vacuum chamber to suck the epoxy down in there. Um, and that will stabilize it, it glues it together and makes it one homogenous piece again. So it's one of those things you kind of got to play with, how big is the crack, is it structural? Um, and in some cases, if the crack is big enough, it's actually best to actually break the handle on that crack and then glue it back together so you get a full glue bond all the way across on it. Uh, but that's pretty rare, and usually at that point, I'm going to want to build a new handle, uh, unless there's something specific to that handle I want to keep. Um, so, yeah, at least I, I do all those things for usability. If I'm doing it for collectability, then it's something completely different, and to disregard everything I said for anything collectible. Um, but if you're trying to save a collectible saw, um, yeah, you probably know what you're doing. <laughs> What's next? I swear every time I'm trying to... I, I, I wait until you do that, and I then, I, know. then I pick you up. Okay. Let's see. Harold asks, can you discuss the differences between BLO and tongue oil? What is your preference on how long does it take for each to poly polymerize? Um, I haven't used tongue oil that much, and so I'm not as, as keen on that. And particularly what, what tongue oil is, is it's actually um, oil from the tongue tree. Um, so it's just like BLO or or olive oil or sesame seed oil or any oil that comes from a plant you crush the plant and you get oil out of it um, and it, it polymerizes very similarly to um, to BLO it's a little bit thicker um, so you can you can build up a surface on it a bit more um, so some people really like it if they're trying to get that that um, almost built up oil finish from just a pure oil but in most things, it's, it's very, very similar. Um, drying time, it really depends on um, the polymerization system, uh, the, the chemical dryers that were put into it or the way it was polymerized, uh, the way it was, it was prepped. Um, so it's pretty similar to, to BLO. Um, boil linseed oil and tongue oil are, for all practical purposes, for the average layman, almost identical. But uh, yeah, um, the, the thing that gets confusing is when people start talking about Danish oil um, because people think Danish oil is a particular oil. It's, it's not. Um, Danish oil is oil plus. Um, and there are thousands of recipes for Danish oil and all sorts of different um, 
polys and lacquers and varnishes and other things that have been mixed in with the oil, usually to build up and give it a, a surface protectant as well as the oil penetrating. Um, so Danish oil is oil plus. And you get a lot of people out there who are adamant that no, Danish oil is BLO plus varnish in this particular ratio. And you get that exact, that's no, any oil plus um, surface protectant is Danish oil. Um, and there are lots of them out there. Um, and so a lot of people get tongue oil and Danish oil confused, but they're, they're two different things. You can have a Danish oil that is tongue oil plus varnish, um, but uh, yeah. What's next? Alrighty. Uh, let's see what Harold asked this time. Have you ever artificially weathered wood to make it look old? What methods did you use? Um, I did a lot of that in the theater because um, you're always trying to make things look like something they're not. Um, and it really depends on the, the type of weathering you're looking for. Um, if you are looking for, like, it's one of the things I like about oak. Is oak is very, very versatile. You can uh, fume it with ammonia. You can put uh, um, a vinegar into it with, um, um, with uh, metal shavings, and that will um, tanninize the, the wood, and you get some really cool colors from it. Uh, most of the time, if I'm looking for a colored weatherization, I'm going to be using a, a stain, um, and I'll do a bunch of different methods for that. And you can do a blotchy stain with a, uh, with a protectant and then peel off some, and I'll put down like a really dark stain and then sand that off or plane off just the top surface of it and then put down a lighter stain so you get that, uh, that coloration difference in it. There's a whole bunch of different uh, uh, painting techniques for uh, weathering wood and making it look older. Um, for texturing, uh, there's different things. And for texturing, it's something you have to really think about and think about how would the table or the bench be used. Um, because uh, let me show you this. Because I've got on on here, I've got you know my my bench has wear marks and it's got these dents and these these cup holes and and things like that. Uh, but here on the corner, I've got these saw marks and, and nicks and scratches in here that are here on the corner and so where I'd be working there'd be a lot of other things and this corner farther away uh, doesn't have as much of that um, and so you got to kind of think about how the surface would be used and then come at it and grind it and hit it and use hammers and chains and beat it up um, or in this case saw marks and things like that and so you got to kind of think through how um, how would the surface have been used and how would it actually have been beat up over time and try to duplicate that. Um, a lot of intentional wearing I actually like to do with chains. Um, you can beat the wood down with that. Um, or um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, flap discs on grinders anytime you can take off a decent amount of material. Um, yeah. So hope that answers your question because there are that's that's like a whole master's degree in weathering wood. <laughs> I mean, I'm not joking. There are entire master's degrees to get dedicated to weathering techniques. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> what, what's the next one? All right, hang on. Uh, hopefully, Harold's last question for a while. Just kidding, Harold. <laughs> Is he still in here? I don't know. Uh. Oh, yeah, he's still in here. Um, I want to, <laughs> says I want to build a shave horse and I mainly, my mom went to, I want to build a snowman. I want to build a shave horse. Have you, you already build a shade horse? made a how-to video? Have you already made a how-to video? Or are you planning to make a video? I have not made a video on a shave horse. Um, I will probably be making one in the next year or so. Um, I want to build an outdoor shop space with a spring pole lathe and a shave horse and some other things like that. Um, I've been thinking about making a shave pony, which actually mounts into the vise, um, and so it's it's a contraption that sits up here and you can work on it, which is kind of nice because it takes up less space. A full shave horse is actually a rather big piece of furniture. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I want to build one. No, I have not. Um, there are um, quite a few good videos out on that, but uh, there aren't as many Ooh, as, as a lot of me. other topics. So yeah, stay tuned. That will probably be coming out in a year or so. Stay tuned for a while. <laughs> I haven't decided what style I want to make, though. So I, I may end up making a couple of them because they're, they're relatively easy. It's just doing it. So 
talking about stay, staying tuned, do you know how you tune two piccolos? <laughs> what? You shoot one. <laughs> <laughs> this from the band girl. I play piccolo. I can. <laughs> um, sorry, sidetrack. That mom joke was free. Uh, <laughs> Brian Fulmer asks, how did James feel about the Knights of White Oak t-shirts? <laughs> I would love to do that. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't had the chance to design anything, but uh, if someone wants to make a design on it, um, shoot it to me and we'll, we'll throw something together for it. But I, I like the idea. <laughs> very, very much. The Knights who say BLO. <laughs> and if you don't know what we're talking about it's from uh, last week's live or the week before or something like that I know I'm surprised they haven't gone off on that tangent <laughs> um, let's see uh, Tiny Witch Shop do you put a secondary bevel on a, the low angle plane no no. I, I don't do secondary bevels on anything I, personally I find it to be a waste of time because it's just an extra step um, I I just want to sharpen it and go. I don't want to be thinking about secondary bevel. Um, and there are people who do all the secondary bevel to speed it up so they only do the secondary bevel until the bevel works back far enough. And they'll regrind a primary bevel, which takes forever. And then they'll put secondary bevels back in. And I just, I find that to be um, just more steps than it's worth. And in the end, it ends up being the same amount of time. It's just you're pushing your time off until later. And the amount of time it saves in any particular step is just not worth it to me. Um, so I don't mess with secondary bevels. Um, yeah. The, the only time I, I think about secondary bevels, uh, the only time I think about like a back bevel is doing the, uh, the ruler trick. If the, the plane, uh, the back isn't perfectly smooth and flat, uh, then I might do the ruler trick on some plane blades like that. Um, but on low angle planes, it kind of defeats the purpose because you have it at a low angle to keep that low angle and you put in a few more degrees while you've made your angle higher. And at that point, it's just as high as a high angle plane. Um, so I, I don't do that. But again, it's a personal preference and there are hundreds of ways of doing it out there and there are people who absolutely love it. So if you like it, go for it. <laughs> You're weird, but you know, it's okay. <laughs> I'm weird. <laughs> That's a pot calling a pot a pot. <laughs> Anyways. What's next? Kenny and Janet Horn asked, how do you feel about bedrock planes? Obviously, obviously, they command very high prices, but what if they were closer in price to a Bailey? Are they worth it? Um, actually, um, 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 oh, come on. What's his name? YouTube channel. Just put out a video on it. Rex. Rex Kruger. There we are. Um, man, total mental blank. Uh, he actually just put out a video on comparing bedrock to regular ones, and I agree with him 100%. He hit it on the head, if I could say it myself. Um, and they are nice. They are good. Um, they, they're they fantastic planes. Um, they're, they're the absolute top notch you can get. But the difference between a bedrock and a regular is not worth the price. It's just not. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's a reason why they are collectible because they didn't sell well, and there's a reason why they weren't. They didn't keep selling them. They just didn't have a market for them because the people who really knew hand planes and used them every day to make their living just didn't feel the price was worth it, and so not as many of them were purchased, and so not as many of them were made, and there are few of them out there, which means they're more expensive now because they're collectible. Um, yeah, they're kind of nice, and theoretically they make it less vibration, and, uh, but in actual function, um, if you were to do a blindfold test between a standard Bailey and a Bedrock, I don't think there's a single person out there who could feel the difference between them. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Although I know I'm opening a can of worms and people will start arguing with me about that because there are a lot of really Bedrock followers out there. But uh, no, you don't need a bedrock to do good work. You can do that with much, much cheaper planes. So that's my, my tenets on it. And that's actually one of the reasons why I don't own a bedrock. I, none of my planes are bedrocks um, because I just haven't seen the, um, the price value of doing it. 
Doesn't mean I won't get in a bedrock eventually because, um, you know, eventually I got to buy everything. So that's the way it goes. <laughs> what are you looking at me that for? <laughs> What's next? You forget the rule. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a rule. Any amount of money I spend, she gets to spend too. <laughs> All right. Uh, That's why I buy all my planes for a dollar ninety-five. <laughs> liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> Let's see, Ben Oldica. I have no idea if I said that right. Any tips or precautions for indoor wood storage? Also, any good storage designs? Asking for a friend. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a video I'm going to be doing here soon. I'm going to be doing a whole video on um, wood storage and drying. Uh, although I might end up making it too, because I've had quite a few questions recently on it. Um, and the the best answer is stickers. Um, here, maybe you should go grab one of my stickers. Uh, not my, not one of Whoa. these stickers. We don't need those, but mine are over here. Um, so I've got this, which is a three quarter by three quarter inch stick. Turn you back around. And this is what is called a sticker. And so most of the time it's about three quarter by three quarter. And you get a few of these and you put them on the surface where you're gonna store your wood. So like two foot apart or so, depending upon the size of the wood. And you put your wood on top of that. And then you put stickers on top of the wood. And then you put wood on top of that. And you put stickers on top of the wood and you, you put wood on that. And that way you separate all your wood by the thickness of your sticker. And that allows air to go all the way around it. And if you're in an air conditioned open shop like where I'm at, it's not really necessary. And it's not, um, it's not uh, as much of a problem because I have almost the exact same humidity in here all year round. I have almost the exact same temperature in here all year round. And so it doesn't really make a whole lot of difference for me. Um, if I am gonna put it directly on the concrete, then yes, I want to level it, levitate it up. If you put wood directly on the concrete, the, the surface that's down will absorb moisture out of the concrete and it will cause it to cup because the, uh, the bottom surface will absorb water faster than the top surface. So the bottom surface will expand because it fills up with water and you'll get it actually cupping up. Um, and so that's why you never store wood directly on concrete. You put stickers down and separate it so there's an air gap. But if you are in an area or an outside space or in a garage that's not air conditioned, where you have air flowing or you have uh, um, humidity changes and temperature changes, your wood is going to expand and contract. And so if you stack it all up in a pile, the surfaces that are outside, uh, the outside of the pile and the top of the pile, they're going to be affected by the weather change much faster because they have open surfaces on it. If you separate everything with stickers, then all of the surfaces will now have air getting to them so that all of the surfaces expand and contract together so your boards aren't warping and changing as much. Um, and so that's why having a whole stock of stickers is a great thing to have. Um, is even if you uh, store wood on shelves, well, your first shelf set that all the wood is on is a sticker and then put stickers on top of that and wood and stickers and wood and stickers. And I'm saying stickers a lot because I like the word stickers. <laughs> Are you stuck on that? I'm stuck on stickers. <laughs> and if you want to buy stickers, I do sell them in my shop. Woodbyright.com backslash shop. Okay, enough of that commercial. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's, that's really the, the big key is allow air to get around all things. Um, and for most joinery, it's not as much of a problem. But anytime you're going to be doing cross-grain joinery, Usually you want to do the joinery and the glue up all in one day and one go. Because if you're in an area where the moisture and temperatures are gonna be changing, you may cut the joinery one day, set it down, and then a day later come back together and one board has swollen and now that tenon won't go into that mortise because it's too big. Um, and so that's why you, you generally want to do your cutting your joinery and assembly in one day unless you can guarantee it. Uh, which is one of the things I love about being in an air-conditioned basement. Um, it's, I, I can do the joinery on one day and come back a month later. It's the exact same size. It just doesn't change. Um, so it's very nice that way. But stickers, let air flow, um, best ways to, uh, to manage your, your, uh, your lumber so it doesn't change too much. Good question. And we'll probably be doing a couple of videos on that here in the future. What's next? So Southern Coin asked, can you do more Sloyd projects? Um, I haven't actually done much of any Sloyd work. What is a Sloyd? 
Um, you have to Google it. Um, it's it's a it's a style basically. Oh. Um, it's not something that really intrigues me. Um, it's not my not my cup of tea. Um, so yeah, kind of like Windsor chairs. Um, I, it's not my cup of tea. I just doesn't intrigue me. So mm. maybe someday I'll do it, but not right now. <laughs> What's next? Okay, I'm not sure if this is a legitimate question or a joke because there's weird words in woodworking. There are lots of weird words in woodworking. It's so, what makes and dad it's jokes cut so twice. good. So I really don't know which category this falls in. So I'm going to ask So it. someone needs to make a, uh, a question with a whole bunch of made-up words. <laughs> Why are you glaring at me? Those are not anti therapy. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, let's see. Do you like old saws and proverbs? Old saws and proverbs? Yes. So I said I'm not sure where it falls in the... I don't know what in the world oh, you're okay. talking about. Okay, cut twice. I'm assuming that was a joke. And It's not too hard to go over Sarah's head, but when it goes over my head... Where is my ducky there. to throw at you? <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Sarah's like this tall. Okay, she's actually about this tall, but... <laughs> I'm travel size. <laughs> For your convenience. <laughs> that was my real size. <laughs> Gotta be that right, sorry. <laughs> oh, we got the number one question going. Oh, no, for Sarah's side, yes. <laughs> uh, let's see. Sir Knight asked, what are James's thoughts on low Roman workbenches, and does he think they are more, pra they are more practical than modern workbenches, especially for beginners? No, no, they're not more practical. Um, they, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no, they're they're fun, they're cool, and there are some nifty things to them, but they are less functional in general. I mean, not functional as in doing the work; they can get the exact same work done, but they are more tedious to do the work on. Um, and again, it's a personal preference. What type of bench do you like? Everyone's going to like a different type of bench. Um, but there's there's a big reason why low benches weren't used, um, weren't carried on very often. Um, and you see a lot of, of progression through woodworking history where they were working on the ground to working on a slightly raised surface to working on something where you can stand up. Um, and that's repeated in several other places except for Japan. Um, where in Japanese woodworking, everything is still done on the ground or this really low bench that they basically kneel as a uh, uh, um, crisscross to sit at. And so it's, yeah, it's a personal preference. I mean, honestly, uh, and Charles Schwartz, Charles Schwartz, <laughs> Charles Schwartz, uh, he actually went through, um, <laughs> he went through a whole series of, of of different benches over time and he's written several books on benches um, and when he got to the Roman bench it was supposed to be kind of like this last bench that you know you're, you finally show off the Roman bench um, and for some reason a lot of people really took off with it like this is the new fad this is the cool thing you know it's actually an old bench that kind of went out of style um, so uh, the, the small amount of woodworking I've done on it I found it to be more of a pain and less enjoyable but there are people out there who really, really love it. So if you like it, great. If not, no. Uh, I think a bench that you can stand at uh, doesn't even have to have the vices and other things. It just makes it easier to be able to stand and work on it rather than sitting down hunched over. But again, personal preference. Oh, uh, is that a super chat? Yes, from Alan. Thank you, Alan, for all of the... Uh, oh, the gnome jokes, yes. <laughs> And we had a garage sale here the other day, and a guy came up and asked, how much for the angry gnome on the lawn? I said, that's my wife. <laughs> wow, well, it's not often she's speechless. And then I realized Alan already posted it. Yeah, I thought you would have got <laughs> You've already had that one thrown at you it's earlier this week. a long week. I mean... Picked on. 
Do you have a but it did, it, the fact that it came out of your mouth and you are still alive, <laughs> miracles to exist. At least Alan pays his dues. <laughs> Rest in peace. <laughs> <laughs> What's the next joke? Or the next question? <laughs> I feel like I should throw the dad joke book at you. <laughs> There's a reason I keep the thousand dollar camera in between the two of us. <laughs> uh, okay, moving on. Oh, I didn't put a time by that question. Good guesswork. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> Besides my funeral. <laughs> If anyone would like to contribute to the James Wright. James Wright Memorial Fund. <laughs> Maybe I should hold a tool sale. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, poor man. Okay, so when you were talking about, I gotta get backstory to this question. The question Harold had about old hand salts and being dry and cracked, and you were talking about fixing them. Mm -hmm. So poor man was asking, is there a special way? just for collectible collectibles no uh, it's if you're collectible you want to do as little as possible um, usually mild soap and very light amount of water with a little bit of scrubbing from a rag is about all you want to do um, just get the dirt off and that's collectible um, you generally want don't want to do anything to anything that's particularly collectible um, but if you're working on a saw that's collectible most of the time you know what it is um, so you I've been through that, but yeah, most of the time with any collectible tool and you want to keep the collector's value on it, you do as little to it as possible. It's just dirt removal and that's about it. What's next? Hang on. It's a good thing we're not newlyweds doing this. <laughs> <laughs> What would Pete Hall have to say? Is there any type of wood that you look at and just go, nope? Example, American hornbeam. Um, no, I've every wood I've touched, I've found some particular use or found something I like or don't like about it. And yeah. Um, I think the only wood that I don't really want to go back to is palm. But you really can't call palm a wood. It's more of like a grass. Um, yeah, palm is just, it's nasty. Um, I mean, it can look good. It's just, it's never a comfortable wood. And it's a pain to work with because it's always splintering and busting out. And it's not a solid wood. It's nothing really durable. It's nothing really structural. It's just palm. But I guess there's some uses for it because it has a good color. So, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think if there's any other wood that I've come across that has been... You'd yeah, have the everything I've tried that that's either been really, really hard or difficult, it's been very enjoyable and well worth it. Um, even with working with like lignum vitae, which is Just the hardest wood in the world Just. on average, it is. It was really cool wood. Smelled fantastic. Was fun to work with. Um, if I had the money, I might do a whole project with it. That stuff's expensive, though. What's next? All right. Let's see. Fan of NHRA asks, I have a new work, new birch workbench. What can I seal the top with? Um, for workbenches, I actually like uh, boiled into oil um, because the the workbench is going to get beat up. I mean, you've seen, you saw the, the the clips I had on this. It is just, it's not a. Uh, it hasn't been left pristine. I've got all these nicks and scratches and cuts and stains and finish gets on it. Um, and so putting on a coat of boiled linseed oil just brings out the color and you're going to be getting more finish on there and you're going to get glue and other things on there and it's going to get its own um, surface. So I, I really don't worry about protecting the surface because it's going to get beat up. It's going to get destroyed. And if you look at a lot of old benches, um, they are just incredibly beat up because that's, that's the life of a bench. It's a tool. Um, and if you're trying to keep it pristine, uh, yeah, you're not my type of woodworker. 
<laughs> but yeah, that's why I, I generally use boiled linseed oil and just coat it, let it soak in as much as it wants, wipe off the excess and paste wax and you're done um, because it's going to be getting a lot of other things. And the, the boiled linseed oil and past, point, blah, 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 blah. the boiled linseed oil and paste wax will um, keep it so that glue doesn't stick. So I'll do glue up on this and be able to peel the glue right off of it. Um, except for where the epoxy works in, but then I just plane it down and then every couple of years I'll take a few shavings off the top and resurface it and be good to go. Um, birch is a little bit softer. This is a, uh, um, this is a um, white oak and walnut edging. Um, so it's a little bit more durable than birch. Uh, but birch would actually be a really good, good wood for a bench. It's, it's soft enough so that when you drop something out, you're gonna be dinging your work. Because if I were to you know, hit something on there, whichever wood is harder is the one that's going to be denting into the other one. So if you have a soft bench, it's gonna get dinged up a lot more. But that means you're not gonna be denting your work when you, when you hit it on the surface. Um, and so that's one of the things I actually miss about my pine bench because I had one out of Douglas fir, um, and that was that was nice because it got beat up all the time. But any of my work that was on it, I didn't have to worry about dings. On this one, I have the walnut around the outside, uh, so that the walnut is a little bit softer. But if I had the white oak on there, the white oak is actually pretty hard, and so a lot of my work would get beat up on it. But because I work with wall, white oak a lot, I like having the walnut on the outside because the walnut. Is harder than the uh, the oak is harder than the walnut, um, but yeah. So that that's my standard spiel for benches. So, so, <laughs> so since it's gone, are you pining for it? <laughs> I'm, I'm furring for it. <laughs> so what rasps can I use for shaping wood? All of them. Um, I don't know what rasp you couldn't use. Whoa, what happened to us? What's that? It like did a funky thing. I don't know. I don't either. Um, yeah, um, uh, rasps. I use anything you want. Like my, f I have files and rasps that I use that are metalworking files. Any of them will work perfectly fine. Um, you just don't want to use a woodworking file or rasp on metalworking. Because the woodworking Whoa. file rasp isn't quite as hard, oh. and so it okay. has hang on, issues. hang on. We're getting a message. What? It's giving the message. Enough. YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. Uh, I don't know. Internet issues. Do you want me to open widget? Um. No, it'll just kick back up. Let me just take a look at what the message is. Yeah, it'll just pick back up once it gets it. Um, yeah, they get just about any type of rasp will work. And it's one of these things where like, I go to antique sales or um, uh, estate sales and things like that, and there's you know, a bucket of files, and I'll buy them all, and I'll get one or two out of it and throw out the rest. Um, I, a lot of people really like uh, Shinto rasps. They're simple. They're easy. Um, you have one side that's aggressive, and where's mine? You have one side that's aggressive and one side that is fine. Um, and so this is my fine side, my aggressive side, so I can take off more. Um, a lot of people really swear by them. I'm, the more I use it, the less I want to use it. Um, just a personal preference again. I don't, I don't enjoy it as much, but it is actually a relatively easy rasp to use. Um, but uh, yeah. Cool. If you like them, great. But. Uh, <laughs> I think it's because I have just so many rasps and files that can do all sorts of little detailed things that I don't have many. If I just had one or two rasps, this would be a good rasp to have um, because it is a good all-around rasp. I just don't find it to be really good at any one particular ta task. I usually have a file or rasp that I much prefer over this for any one particular task. Um, but this is a, a good generalist, so yeah. What's next? Oh, uh, let's see. Mr. Q. So talking planes and money is the only reason why Stanley number ones are so high is lack of supply. And is there such a big difference? Um, they have almost always had a collectible aspect to them. Um, even when they were still being sold, if you had a Stanley number one, you had something special. Um, and so I mean, you go back and you look at, um, oh, what's his name? The, uh, he made a toolbox. He was a piano worker. Um, 
the Studley tool chest. There we are. Um, and he has, you know, a whole pile of tools in this, and it's absolutely gorgeous. And he has this one little alcove that is intricately carved and gorgeous. And in this alcove is the Stanley number one, um, something very special back then. Um, and there weren't many of them made because they were more expensive and they were less usable. Um, they're basically a block plane. And so most places where you would use a Stanley number one, you might as well use a block plane. A lot of people have specialized that they were for kids' toys or they were for small hands, and those really aren't true. They were sold and advertised as a plane for the average person. Um, they were just the smallest one they had. Uh, but because they were small, they were more expensive, and because they were more expensive and less useful, very few people bought them. There weren't many of them. And so it's kind of like this whole thing coming together that they were originally looked at as something special. There weren't many of them purchased or made, which drives up the price. And nowadays that they aren't made anymore, they are just like this, <gasps> and so they're usually around $1,000 for the hand plane, and that's, that's the average going price for a decent one. Um, and you get one that's in parts, and it might still be sold for around $600. Um, they're, they're incredibly expensive, but it's because they're collectible. I was actually at a Midwest tool collector's meet once, and I was walking by this table, and the guy had three Stanley number ones sitting out, which is just like, you never see more than one of them at a time. And he had three of them on the table. It's like, oh, you have three of them. That's cool. And so I was taking a couple pictures. He's like, you want to see something? He reaches down. He pulls out a bin and has another dozen of them in a, in a bucket. And he was still selling them. This, the cheapest one he had was $990. Um, <laughs> so it's a, it, it's a collectible thing, basically. They, they don't have any general practical use. Um, though there are people who will force themselves to find a use for it, they, they generally don't have a use. And so that's why I don't have a number one. I have a space that No, really that is not why you one. have a not you don't have a number one. Yeah. The thousand dollar price tag is why you don't have one. Let's just get real here. <laughs> They're uh, family. <laughs> I saw there was one number one I was looking at a while ago that I really, really tempted. It was five hundred dollars but it had been dropped, cracked, and brazed back together. And the brazing job was pretty poor, but it was $500 still. Uh, any other plane that was that beat up and, and broken would be you know, five, six bucks. Um, but no, it's still $500 because it's a number one. Um, actually, um, Hand Tool Rescue, he has a number one. And his number one has a welded plate on the side. Uh, not a well, a riveted plate on the side. Uh, so that's kind of a... <laughs> But it's still worth several hundred dollars, even with a riveted plate on the side of it. Yeah. Cool. What's next? Okay, hang on. What would what would Sarah buy if James bought a number one? A She'd buy a lot. A of clothes. vacation. You don't have any PTO over vacation. I didn't say I was taking you with me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I was thinking, man, you used to be able to buy a car for a thousand dollars. Yeah. My first three cars were less than five hundred. <laughs> well, <laughs> we won't talk about the quality of said vehicle. <laughs> uh, let's see. Who we got a question from? Um, Tom Feller. I noticed you use Osmo on the bed and Rubio on the desk. Can you compare the two hard wax finishes? Um, on the bed, I actually used um, water locks. Um, not, I didn't use a hard wax on that. Water locks is basically a poly, uh, polyurethane finish. It's not quite, but it's, um, it, water locks really looks like boiled in oil, but has a solid protective finish like a poly. So you get that um, little bit more of a, of, a, of a film finish with the water locks. Um, I have used Osmo. Um, I generally prefer Rubio Monocoat. I find it just to be a little bit easier, a little bit simpler. Um, and I, I, I am honestly in love with Rubio Monocoat. If a surface needs a protective finish and the client has any particular say to it, I'm putting Rubio, Rubio Monocoat on it um, because it is, it's incredibly easy. You literally dump it on the surface, you rub it around, you let it sit for 15 minutes pooling up on the surface, and you wipe off the excess and it's done. That's all you need to do. That, that's, that's the whole thing on it, and it's, it's good to go. Um, you know, a couple hours later, and you can, you can be using the surface. 
Uh, and then like on our dining room table, if, if we ever get a spot where I have a problem, I just dump on more, let it soak in, wipe it off, and it completely blends in perfectly. It fixes itself and it's absolutely gorgeous. It is the most matte, beautiful, it feels fantastic. Um, it looks like a boiled in cereal on paste wax finish, but yeah, it's protective, water gets on it, no problem. I have it on my desks, my table upstairs. If you can't tell, I'm in love with this stuff. It is, it's phenomenal. Um, and there's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a good finish. It's easy, it's protective. Um, there's, it's easy to fix. Yeah, it's just all around fantastic. Uh, Osmo is very, very similar. Osmo I just find to be a little less finicky, a little bit more finicky, and I, I'm not as happy with the standard colors as I am with, uh, with uh, uh, Ruby Monaco. So that's why I use Ruby Monaco. All right. What do we got? Kenny and Janet Horner. Let's see. Given that flat, straight, and square are relative terms, how flat, straight, or square does a board need to be? In other words, when is good enough? <laughs> that's a great question. Um, it is good enough when it's good enough. Um, you know, some people will actually measure the sides of their board and the thicknesses of their board with a micrometer or with the uh, the calipers. And you know, if I'm within a couple millimeters one side or the other, pff, it's good enough. Um, very, very rarely do I need the board to be perfectly flat or perfectly clean or perfectly square. Um, uh, I only go until it, it's something that needs to be. If I'm joining two boards edge to edge to edge, then I want those two boards to have a good fit. And I'm going to go until I have a good fit or until the clamping pressure can give me a good fit. I don't need anything more than that. Um, on the surface, if I can rub my hand over and it feels fine, it's good. Um, you go up to my table, and then even on that, there's a few spots where you rub your hand off and you'll actually feel kind of like a divot in the table where I actually had to card scraper through some tear out. Um, and that's perfectly fine to me. Um, I, I don't have anything joining to that surface. So I don't have to worry about it being absolutely gorgeously flat. And you go back and look at a lot of antique things and you run your surface over it and you'll realize it's like ridged and, and looks horrible to modern eyes, but that's just, that's normal. It's not something you actually see. It's not something you can actually feel quite as easily, but it's not perfectly flat. You put a straight edge on it. You see all this light coming through it. It's, yeah. Um, there are a lot of people who really, really overthink making things true and perfect. Uh, wood will move. Wood expands and contracts and warps and twists. Um, and it's going to do that after the project is done. Um, so don't, don't worry about it too much. Wood is a, a living thing that is constantly changing. It is not metal where you can put it to a precise measurement. Because if you put wood to a precise measurement and come back an hour later, it'll be a different measurement. Uh, that's just what, what wood does. Um, so if you're measuring your board thickness with one of these, 99.9% .9 of the time, you're doing it wrong. Ooh, I just made some really big enemies with, uh, with uh, machinists. Machinists who try to do woodworking are the worst people to try and answer questions with because you can't take a machinist mindset to woodworking. You, you can't. Um, because woodworking is, you get things close enough and it's good. You're not actually measuring things and making them perfect. Um, yeah, you just get it close enough and you're okay. <laughs> it's not the place to be a perfectionist. What's next? So um, Tom just did a ah. super check. Knights of the White Oak, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. You got one for him? Sure. Uh, let's see here. Why is Cinderella bad at soccer? <laughs> Why is Cinderella bad at soccer? Please tell me. Because she's always running away from the ball. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? <laughs> Welcome to our lives. <laughs> like literal lives, not this life. <laughs> we lay in bed at night and going through Facebook and just looking for the jokes and telling them to each other. Okay, it's a good one. <laughs> uh, all right. 
Uh, let's see. Just so you, anybody who's posting new questions, I'm not sure we're going to get to them. Unless you throw up a super chat, then we'll get to Unless it. Unless you throw up a super chat, because I have like 10 more questions, and I'm not even sure we're going to get through all those. Uh, Tiny Witch Up. Ever think about making a split Rubio workbench? Um, not really. Um, I've done some work on split tops, and I don't like them. The, the reason for split tops is not because it's historical. It's not historical. That's something that's rather new, actually. The reason for a split top is it's very rare to get a 20-inch planer, a 20-inch thickness planer. And so you got power to people who want a good bench, but they don't want to run massive slabs and then glue them together because then you're going to have joint problems and you're going to have to flatten it afterwards. So what they'll do is they cut it in half and they run one slab through and they run their own other slab through and they have a slot down the middle and they say, ooh, this is for tool storage. Well, then you have tool storage in the middle of your bench. I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't get that. And every time I've tried to use a split top bench, it's just annoyed the snot out of me. Um, yeah, it, it's one of those things that I just don't get. Um, so no, I'm not a fan of split top benches. But don't get me wrong, a lot of people out there really like it. And if you're a hybrid person or someone who has power tools, you're probably going to make a split top bench because you can run half the bench through your planer. Um, <laughs> that's that's the reason for it right there. Um, but yeah, no, it's, if you look at drawings of, of uh, um, Rubo drawings for benches, they are monolithic slabs. Um, they're big beasts, or they will have a tool tray, uh, which is more common in the, uh, the English style. Um, but the, the split top is not, uh, not for me. <laughs> so, there, I've said my piece. <laughs> What's next? <laughs> Let's see. Dennis Miko asks, what are your favorite woodworking books? Um, I really don't have many favorite woodworking books. I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a big book reader. Um, I, it is, for me, it is very labor intensive to read a book as opposed to going out and experimenting or talking with friends or um, working through with other people who've experimented with things before. Um, and so for, because of that, I, I don't really recommend a lot of books. <coughs> but if you go to my, uh, um, my website, I actually do have a page on there with, with recommended books. Uh, there aren't too many on there, and they're the pretty common ones that everyone says. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't get into a lot of books. I mean, I've read 30 or 40 of them, but very few do I actually be like, ooh, this is a great book, I, because it, it takes so much effort for me to read the book that it takes away from the, the learning and enjoyment of it. So that's just me. Give me a video any day. That's why I'm on YouTube. What's next? Tim Royal asks, since we are talking about benches, would you still add the apron on yours other than for the gorgeous coughing? Ca carving. Um, the apron on mine isn't really useful. Um, but I love the design on it. Um, I love having that live edge that goes different heights from one leg to the other. I, I really, really like that. So I would probably do that again because it pleases me, makes me happy. It Functionally, me. no, but it does pleases me. It pleases me greatly. <laughs> like my wife. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, that does not reciprocate. <laughs> I'm sitting here, thank you very much. <laughs> Taking the abuse you give me. What's next? Hey, thinking of James's coffin. <laughs> <laughs> that's next actually a project I'm going to do one of these days is make a, an old-fashioned coffin. Hey, you know what? That's my theory about the story about um, vampires sleeping in coffins. What? No, because in, um, like, I think it's, Greek Orthodox, they would sleep in their coffins. Legit. I've been to one priest's house and he had a coffin in his house and they sleep in it. It is the weirdest thing to ever see. I was like, not creepy at all. Nice guy. But, <laughs> but there you go. There's my thought behind that. Um, anyways, back to woodworking. Aaron Fenn, have you ever used ironwood for a project? Um, 
Well, first off, you have to determine what is ironwood because there are like two dozen woods that people call ironwood. Um, and it's kind of like this slang term for any hardwood. Um, and there are a couple Australian woods that are specifically called ironwood. Um, and they are very good, but on average, they're actually a little softer than, um, than lignum vitae. Um, and with any particular wood, depending upon where you get it in the tree and the specific growth of tree, you might have one wood that's harder than another. Um, but yeah, uh, it would depend on which ironwood you're talking about. I haven't actually used any of the Australian ironwoods, um, but there are several other woods that bear the name ironwood that I've played with. But uh, having used lignum, lignum vitae, which is the hardest average wood, um, it's fun. It's like it's like cutting aluminum mostly. Yes. And yes, you can use you can do aluminum woodworking aluminum working with planes. Um, I actually had a video a while ago where I was planing brass. Um, just have to be very, very careful with it. What's next? All right, let's see. Um, the Buck Hunter 270 just dropped my brand new number seven plane on the floor and cracked it. Mm. Is it salvageable? JB uh, Weld maybe? You might get away with JB Weld. Um, the, the historically most common best way to do it is to braise it shut. Um, and so what you'll do is you'll take the plane, back the iron out, keep the iron and frog in place, keep it all locked down, um, and lock it down to some flat surface so that it won't warp and distort, distort on you. Um, once it's been uh, clamped down to a surface so it won't move around, then you can braise that cut shut. Um, you heat it up big time and you add in your braise, which is basically a, so a solder. Um, and then you can come back and file it off and smooth it out. Uh, that's generally considered the best way to do it because you're not heating it up too much and you're not creating too much tension inside of it. Um, if you are really, really, really good with welding, you might be able to get away with welding. Um, the farmer fix is to actually rivet on or um, bolt on a plate to the outside. Uh, but brazing is usually the, the best method. It's not easy, but it can be done. Yeah, good luck. Not happy. What's next? We have time for two or three more? Two or three more? Okay. Let's see. Alan asked, what is James's or any other right head's favorite butcher block finish? Um, I like homemade boiled linseed oil. Um, boiled linseed oil, not from the store, the homemade stuff, so it's just linseed oil that has been heated up to polymerize. It gets into the wood, and once it polymerizes, it stays in pretty well. My next favorite would probably be a, um, um, oh, it's an orange smelling stuff. And I can't remember the name of it, but it's, it's basically like orange oil uh, mixed in with a, with a, with a um, linseed oil. Um, that's gonna be, someone, will, someone will put it in the comments and sold at most of the big box stores. Um, then the, the good old standby is, is uh, mineral oil. Um, because it doesn't, it doesn't rot. The problem with mineral oil is it doesn't polymerize, and so you need to constantly be reapplying it because it will work its way out of the wood and it will get washed out. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different things on it. I know a lot of people swear by salad bowl finish from um, General General Finishes. It does really good work and stays really well. Um, but once you start getting into the question of what is food safe, you start making a bunch of arguments. So yeah, what's next? Oh, uh, let's see. Miguel Lopez, any advice on cutting round tenons for a table bench leg with no lathe, spoke shave, or draw knife? Um, they actually make a tool called a tenon cutter. Um, and so what this does, this is a little bit more fancy one, uh, but you, it cuts round tenons. You put it in here and, and you put this on your, your brace. And it runs around and actually will cut the round peg on the end. And you can usually pick these up online for uh, 15 to $30, depending upon type. If you go to handtoolfinder.com, I actually have a list of online sellers, um, and you'll be able to find quite a few tenon cutters on there. And so that's, that's usually my answer, because that's what this is designed to do. It makes it very quick, very easy, very accurately, and you get a nice, good, round tenon. Um, but he said, without a draw knife, without a spoke shave, without a what? 
Hang on, I gotta find draw knife. Draw knife, spoke shave. Okay. Um, without those, then I'd probably get it close with a chisel and then clean it up with a rasp and file and get it down to the size I would want. Um, rasp and file can do a lot of work really fast, especially if you get a good good rasp on there. Um, trying to think, you can do it with a card scraper. It's just gonna take a little longer. Um, or you could always do it with a knife and just whittle it down with an old-fashioned knife. Have a lot of fun. There's a thousand ways to do it. <laughs> What's next? Uh, let's see. What did Kevin Lerma ask? Can you talk about in-canal gouges and how to sharpen them, please? Um, actually, I have a video on that. Um, I actually, it, it, they, you sharpen them almost identical to how you sharpen a... Um, uh, Stanley 45 or 55 um, um, hollow um, cutter. And uh, I, I generally just do it with, well, depending upon the, the, the gouge, what I'll do is take a, I'll take dowel and wrap sandpaper around it, and then I'll just sharpen it with that. Uh, it takes a little bit more time, but it works fairly well. Um, if you have slip stones, that's the best way to do it. Um, but they kind of get expensive. The, the tool that I use probably the most, but you're going to spend for it, is the DMT Wave. Um, and this is kind of cool because it's got the, the exact wave you want. And so I'd set it on here, and I'd work with a space about that big, and I'd just go and clean it down. So I can get this in several different uh, grits. And so I can do all of my gouges, depending upon what size I want, in candle or... Uh, traditional gouge and these are these are a lot of fun but yeah it's called the DMT wave um, but the most common the, the, the traditional way is a slip stone but you can just take sandpaper and wrap it around a uh, dowel and it'll do the same uh, if you're gonna be doing the same one a lot what you want to do is carve a surface that is the exact same camber as the iron by just using the chisel to to, to carve into a block of pine or something like that and then put sandpaper on that and you can use that to do the whole surface at once. Or you let it block down and then run your gouge over it to, to sharpen it on that. So. Cool. Um, I think we are out of time. How many well, questions? Well, I apparently there? skipped this question that would have been before this question I just asked. So. Ah, okay. We'll it do was, one more question then. It was brought by my attention by not the person who asked it. So I feel <laughs> like I need to... Um, oh, there's a microphone there. Um, Josh... Ozenbaugh asked, I'm building a set of wooden planes. I've already built a single iron jack. For the jointer and smoother, I'll need double irons, correct? Do you have recommendations on where to get those? Um, you don't need double irons. They are useful. Um, but <clears throat> particularly on the smoother, I, I would get a, the double iron on there. Um, yeah, when you're actually getting into like old style irons, I'm probably going to buy an old iron, an old plane that's beat up and then steal the iron from it. That's the, the way I'm usually going to go because it's the cheapest route. Um, but there's nothing saying that you can't go and buy one of the new irons from um, one of the manufacturers such as Hawk or, um, or Veritas and actually get one of theirs with a, the chip breaker and put it in and it works just the same. Um, I don't know if there are any new makers that sell old style um, iron and, and shipbreaker combos. It would be interesting. I'll have to look that up. But yeah, no, normally I, make, I would go and buy one for, for a metal body plane or I would buy a wooden body plane that's beyond use and, and steal the iron from it. So yeah. Well, if I didn't get your questions, feel free to send me an email. Um, my email is in the About tab on the channel page. Um, or you can hit the uh, contact me form on my website. So I think that'll do it for now. You might want to check out Saturday's video. It oh. might be a special cameo. Yeah, Sarah is going to be in the video. She was the one doing a big deal of work hint. for it. So. I was trying to hint. You don't hint well. I do not hint well. My hints are pretty bland and obvious. <laughs> hit me upside the head with a 2 by 4 and tell me what you want for Christmas. That's my hint. <laughs> So, on that note, I think that'll about do it for today. And until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye.